We will now move to our second speaker on the proposition side of the house. Fenella Tice is a first year reading classics at Newnham College. She won this slot through open audition. Fenella, you have the ear of the house. It is my honor, following International Women's Day, to make my case for Sparta. My opponent's speech possessed some excellent points, understandable if she was a man. Women are consistently overlooked in classical scholarship and debate, but through my argument, I will prove that a state like Athens that belittles and undermines the autonomy of its female inhabitants should by no means be preferable to anyone of any gender. My sources are limited to the elite, so I am talking about elite women, not helots. Gorgo, the aforementioned queen of Sparta during the Persian Wars, wife of the mighty King Leonidas, is one of the only women to be mentioned in the entirety of Herodotus and played an instrumental role during the wars. When she was asked by a disgruntled Athenian woman, Ugh, why are you Spartan women the only ones who can rule men? She retorted, because we are the only ones who give birth to men. Excellent. <laughs> More than just being vessels for strong Spartan progenies, Lacedaemonian females were actively nurtured and empowered in a way that Athenian women never were. Six points form my argument. Point one, education. While Athenian women were simply being taught by their mothers how to cook and clean, Sparta had an institutionalized educational program for girls as early as the Archaic period. Spartan women were, contrary to fact, taught to speak and encouraged to do so. Out of these emerged strong females with unprecedented and unmatched literary skill and flair. The Athenian playwright Aristophanes mentions a female Homer, not within his misogynistic, male-dominated sphere, but in Sparta, a female poet named Clytagora. Number two, fitness. Lycurgus, legendary lawgiver of Sparta, entrenched the idea that women should exercise just as much as men. Nowhere else in Greece were women allowed to exercise. Bare-breasted Spartan girls built up their muscles and finesse in the fields of Laconia, while Athenian girls sat, barely leaving the house, and never without an escort. Spartan women quite literally kicked ass. They performed a dance called the Bibasis, where they leapt up energetically and kicked their bottoms. Certainly, coronavirus would not have stood a chance for these fit and healthy Spartans, especially regarding the state's isolationist policy during the classical period. <laughs> Number three, marriage. Women in Sparta, as has been mentioned, got married far later than any other Greek state. While underdeveloped 13-year-old Athenian girls were being forced into marriages to men many years their senior, Spartan women were given a childhood and an education before marrying men close to them in age and becoming the matriarch of their own household. Athenian men couldn't even own the properties that they inhabited. When choosing a, spa, a, a partner, Spartans would have already seen their potential spouses fully nude as they exercised together in the fields, an ancient version of the TV program Naked Attraction. <laughs> wouldn't you be able, to, wouldn't you to like to be able to view before you choose? <laughs> Number four, sex. An active and pleasurable sex life for both husband and wife was seen as vital for creating strong children. Unusual tastes meant that it was customary for the Spartan bride to dress up as a man on their wedding night. But who were we to argue against a little role play? <laughs> Unlike the rife 
pederasty in Athens, where young boys were routinely molested as part of society. Xenophon asserts that in Sparta, pederasty was condemned, instead encouraging healthy reciprocal sexual relations within the marital chamber. Aristophanes, in his play Lysistrata, famously calls the Spartans wankers. <laughs> well, I'd rather be a wanker than a pedo. <laughs> Number five, food. Athenian women were deliberately underfed from birth, with men being given the fat cuts of meat, and their wives, mothers, and little girls undernourished with the scraps. Spartan women were nurtured with equal portions of food, aided by Sparta's successfully self-sufficient state, which, unlike Athens, did not rely on agricultural imports. Yes. Um, get the microphone to... <coughs> Thank you. Hewitt with Trinity College. Just, you say successfully self-sufficient state. Would you mind telling me where Sparta is now? <laughs> it was, yes, I agree, it was very much funded by helots and a lot of abuse, and, uh, but at least we didn't have to create a really bad empire which eventually failed and to extort wealth from them. So I'd rather have, yeah, self-sufficient, let's just say that. <laughs> Number six, wine. Spartan women were the only women in Greece who could drink wine in the private sphere. As an oinophile, I cannot, side, I cannot side with a state such as Athens, which restricted women from socializing with men and only permitted a sporadic sip of wine at a religious festival. A Laconian vase depicts women engaging with men as equals in a mixed symposium, instead of the Athenian practice of leaving their wives at home and hiring prostitutes and adolescent boys for company. Thus, the women of Athens, bearers of future Athenians, women whom Pericles and Phidias were suckled by, were undernourished, uneducated, secluded, and sedentary, a state which provided such an independent, empowered, and progressive lifestyle to their women is incomparable to one which sought to neglect, niglade, nigrade, degrade, that's the one, <laughs> and control based on gender. For these reasons, Sparta undoubtedly champions over Athens. Oh, and P.S., Sparta won the war. <laughs> <laughs>